Good morning. I want to welcome all of you here this morning who are here with us in person. Also want to welcome uh, those of you who are with us via Facebook. Uh, we are glad you're here and we're glad you're with us this morning. I want to particularly welcome uh, Jenny Carroll and her daughter Carolyn down at the beach and Bertha Ann Chandler. Um, we're glad to have you with us. I want to remind all of you that whether you're here in person or with us uh, via Facebook, it's no accident. Whether you came kicking or screaming, whether you came gladly and willingly, it is by the, the grace of a sovereign God who brings us to this place in time to touch our lives, renew us, and so that we might have fellowship with him through Jesus Christ. So you're in the right place at the right time. Other announcements. Um, first, I need to say, I forgot a couple weeks ago, I need to say thank you to uh, Ross, who's up in the uh, balcony today, and Laura, who spent endless hours. We had a wedding here, hosted a wedding a couple weeks ago, and they were here from dawn to well after midnight on a Friday night, worked very hard to make that wedding come off, and I want to thank you both. Uh, you did a great job, and I it just, sorry, I, I just didn't, I'm not on it. I also want to remind you that we'll have Pastor on the Porch this Tuesday, um, and if the porch is or patio, and if the, it's raining, we'll just bring it on inside. So I, I hope uh, those of you who like to do that will, will come. I think that's the announcements I have. Let me give you birthdays and people to pray for this week. Leah Montgomery, Grant O'Brien, Chandler White, Terry O'Brien, Timmy McCutcheon, Ashlyn Adams, and Hal Rogers. How old are you going to be, Hal? You want to tell us? 93? <laughs> 70, 73. You look good for your age, buddy. So we'll remember those, <laughs> we'll remember those folks in our prayers. Uh, as we begin our worship this morning, I want to begin with the 18th Psalm, and I'm going to use Eugene Peterson's translation. Listen to the Word of God. He, the psalmist is failing, falling in life. And he says... But the Lord caught me. He reached all the way from the sky. He pulled me out of the ocean of hate, the enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. They hit me when I was down, but God stuck by me. He stood me up in a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised by love. God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. He gave me a fresh start. Now I'm alert to God's ways. I don't take God for granted. Let's pray. Father, as we begin our worship, we are those who were surprised by love. You saved us in love. You saved us for love. You saved us that we may know ourselves in Jesus Christ whole. That we may know joy and peace. We are gathered here today to praise you for your goodness and to be transformed in your presence. Do with us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
celebrating today Don's 35th day of being ordained as a minister. Year. 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 So what did I say? Day. day. It was 2020, wasn't it? Okay. 35 years, and so we figured out he's been with us for five years, so we appreciate the, the five years that we've had with you. And what a special day. It is. And we also want to congratulate Cindy on her recent ordination. And so we have a bag full of little notes. And if anybody didn't have put a note in here, if you want to give Don one, um, notes of encouragement and love. And also, um, we found out Monday, but, um, he has a new favorite restaurant in Charleston, Florence's Low Country Kitchen. Yes. And so we got him a gift certificate, he and Cindy, and we want to say congratulations to the Reverend Muncie's. To Don on his 35th anniversary of ordained ministry, and to Cindy on her recent ordination. Love and prayers from your friends at Williamsburg Presbyterian Church. Yes, thank you. He said it was the best muscles he's ever had. <laughs> I thought about it this morning. I know Eleanor Foxworth, but she would have had a proclamation, and she would have written it out, and we would be sitting here for about 15 minutes about... I'm so sorry no, you didn't know her. Don't. I'm so sorry. I mean, I thought about it last night. I'm like, oh, I miss Miss Eleanor. I mean, she would have been using her thou's and her perfect English and written this long proclamation that she would have given you. No, this is but I hope this was just a little token of our appreciation and love for you. Yes, so we yes. thank you. Thank you. Before you come, are you done? I'm done. Uh -oh. Before you come up, I want to rebut. I just, I really want to say thank you. Um, 35 years seems like a long time, but I still haven't really figured out how to do this very well, and I really do appreciate your patience and love. This is the church that I've always looked for, always wanted to be part of, and I am just as grateful as I can be to be here with you. So thank you very much. All right, Mary, so come and dig us out of here. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hear our prayers today. Quiet our minds and let us know that you are here with us. Be with those that are not able to be here with us physically today as we worship here. May they all feel your presence during this service and throughout the week. Be with those that are sick and suffering. May they feel your presence in healing touch. Be with those that feel alone. May they feel your presence in comfort. Be with the parents, educators, administrators, and students as they work in new ways to return to structured education. We ask that you continue to walk with us during these unprecedented times. Be with those on the Gulf Coast as they prepare for severe weather this week. May we all feel a sense of peace and accept the inevitable change that we will face. May all of our actions and interactions with others be Christ-like. As in the words of the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi and also the hymn Eternal Life, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we were born into eternal life. Now let us affirm what we believe in the words that you have given. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. One more word about being here at 35, or, or being pastor of 35 years. Um, I celebrated my 30th anniversary here, and you all didn't know it. And I've been here just a couple weeks, and I remember thinking that that morning, I hope they keep me, because they're just such wonderful people. And that the last five years have gone by so fast. 35 years, I was thinking, when Laura's coming up with the little balloons, I thought, I remember talking to my grandmother. She lived to be 98. And I remember asking her, and she was pretty, in really good health until her last uh, few weeks. Uh, she died kind of suddenly. And I said, Grandma, what's it feel like to be 98? I mean, you were born in 1900. I remember taking her to the Indianapolis Speedway, and there was uh, old cars. And I, we were walking along, just looking at them. And there was a 1912, and my grandmother said, I remember that car. She's 12 years old. That's just, just amazing to me. How... how how does it feel to be almost a century old? And she said, well, I really don't feel that old until I try to get off the sofa. So it, it doesn't feel like 35 years have gone by at all, not at all, until I try to get up the steps. All right, that, enough of that now. I'm, I'm going to get on with it. Um, I'm going to read to you from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. But before I do, um, let's just be still. Be quiet and prepare our hearts to hear God's word. Let's pray silently together. The word of God. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, what are people saying about who the Son of Man is. And they replied, Some think he is John the baptizer, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. And he pressed them, How about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, 
You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you really are. You are Peter, the rock. And on this rock, I will put together my church, a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door, no more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven, and no on earth is a no in heaven. And he swore his disciples to secrecy. Made, he made them promise that he would tell no one that he was the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me give you a time and place. Context is everything. The time is maybe as far as two years into Jesus' ministry. Think about it. They've been together for two years. It begins with Jesus saying to them, come and see. Come and see. In the Gospel of John, all the, all the disciples are, are, are made to be followers of Jesus simply by saying, come and see. And they've had two years to experience, perhaps as much as two years to experience, Jesus' words, his teaching, uh, his, the miracles that he's done, raise the dead, heal the sick, deliver the demon-possessed. Uh, we looked a few weeks ago at uh, when he um, stilled the storm, came to them walking over the water. For the first time he saved them, used his power for them, and they worshiped him literally for the first time. Who is this? And even the wind and waves obey him. And now it comes time to ask some questions takes them to a quiet, remote place. And that's the other thing. The, place is, the, the time is one thing. The place is another. The, the place is remote and, and beautiful. Caesarea Philippi is on the uh, slopes of Mount Hermon, a forested, beautiful part of Palestine. He takes them away to a quiet place. And, and don't we sometimes need to be in a place apart so that we can get some perspective on our lives? That's what this is about. We're going to step away for a minute and we're going to put everything in perspective. Who do people say that I am? And the first to answer to the first question, to answer the first question is, is fairly easy because you're talking about what other people think and say. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. What do you get from what you get from these answers is first, they're different. They're, they're a little different from each other, but they're all complementary. And they all fall short because they're comparing Jesus to some known person. And, it, and what's interesting to me is they didn't, nobody mentions Moses, who is the greatest of all the Old Testament figures. Nobody mentions Moses. They're all complimentary. They all fall short. And by the way, in exactly eight days, Peter, James, and John will be with Jesus on the mountain and they will see a Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus. In other words, Jesus is far greater than anything they can begin to compare him with. And so he asks them the $64,000 question. But you, who do you say that I am? And now it gets personal. And that's where I want to go with this sermon this morning. Knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is first personal. Who do you say that I am? It's personal. It's, it's relational. Remember in, in John chapter 15, it's the abiding life. I abide, you abide in me and my words abide in you. We abide with each other. It's an ongoing relationship. It's not to know about someone. It's to know them personally. It's to move away from they, them, he, she, or it to me and you. To know Jesus personally. Me and you. It's not about learning principles. It's about being in relationship with a person. I, when I was at Inquire in the ancient days, and before you get to candidacy, you have to meet with the uh, Candidates Committee of Presbytery. I was at Bo in Boston at Gordon-Conwell, drove down to Washington where my wife's folks lived, left her there, drove down to Richmond where the Presbytery, I was uh, home Presbytery was, and I was going to meet with the Candidates Committee. 
Elizabeth Ottmeyer was, a pre, uh, was the um, uh, professor of New Testament. She was nationally known, spoke at conferences, and, and I saw her name on the, on the list of people on the candidates committee, which was elite for me, and she was one of the people on the committee, and I thought, good Lord, you know, I, I'm in trouble. She is first rate, and I was intimidated. And I remember sitting in the car before I went into the, uh, the hall where we were going to meet, just praying, Lord, please get me through this. Don't let me say anything stupid. Just get me through this. So we went in and they asked you really questions about your faith. And Elizabeth Ostermeyer, they all introduced themselves. And she turned to me and she said, so who is Jesus? Well, I'd been through first semester of theology and New Testament um, introduction to New Testament studies and Greek, and I thought, well, I started to think he's the Son of God, he's the Word made flesh, he's God incarnate, he is uh, um, the maker of all things, all things were made through him, he's the perfect image of the living God, and she just, who is Jesus to you? Like that, I was taken aback, and I said, he's my Savior and Lord. She did like this again, <laughs> finally. She didn't want to hear anything about what I believed about him, but whether or not I knew him as my Savior and Lord. Knowing Jesus is, first of all, personal. You know, we have two faiths, an operating faith, the way we live, and a professed faith, what we say we believe. And those come together only in the person of Jesus. That is, as we live with an abiding life with him, day by day, living in his presence, knowing Jesus is first personal. Then knowing Jesus is also to live the blessed life. His first words to uh, Simon after Simon says that he is the Christ is, blessed are you, Simon. I've said to you before what I think about the blessed life. The blessed life is to forgive the past, to redeem the past, which is much harder than simply to forgive it. You are not haunted by any guilt or shame. Failures become vehicles of grace. His grace, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. The past is forgotten and redeemed. The present is affirmed. The road to heaven starts here and now. Some years ago, I, I preached a sermon in, um, in Jonesboro Prison. It's in southwestern uh, Virginia. It's a maximum security prison. Uh, D.C. doesn't have a jail. They send all their prisoners to... Jonesboro, it's also where every, uh, it's a federal prison too, so there are a lot of uh, very difficult people there. Um, I was invited to preach, I had to get a background check, Cindy went with me, uh, I brought along a, a guy who does music for me, he was going to do special music, he'd been a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, I thought he could, he could do that, he could, do, he could help me get through this. So we go in the building, uh, and all, nothing but clanking metal and concrete. Deeper, deeper, deeper. And then the guard opened the door, and there's a big auditorium. And uh, he closed the door and locked it, and he's outside. So there were about 250 prisoners, and Cindy and I, and the music man and his wife, and the chaplain. And I, I thought I'd take my cues from the chaplain. If he got nervous, I'd get nervous. But if he wasn't nervous, I'd be okay. And I remember sitting there and looking out at these guys, lots of skinheads, lots of gangbangers, lots of dangerous-looking people. And I, and I just, as they were playing the music, I was just paying attention to them. And you know what the image that occurred to me was this is a junkyard. This is where the throwaways the guys who wreck their lives and wreck other people's lives. This is where they go. These are where the neglected, the unwanted end up. This is a bad place to be. Just us in this hollow metal place away from everything and everyone else. This is a human junkyard. I wasn't going to preach to them that, that night as a Presbyterian pastor to a bunch of federal prisoners. It was going to have to be People to people. And I shared parts of my story with them that I wouldn't share anywhere else. And it felt pretty safe to share it there. After all, we were in the bowels of a prison and just us and the guards were outside. And it was a very special night for me because we talked about the blessed life starts here and now 
they may treat you as, and you may feel like, junkyard people. But lots of God's people get their start or go through prison. Not the least of which Joseph, Peter, Paul. God only works with broken tools. The road to heaven for you starts here and now. You don't need to be somewhere else. You don't need to go somewhere else. You don't need to be someone else. Jesus takes us as we are, heals our past, and meets us where we are right in the present. I I don't know what it was for them, um, but it was a, a holy moment for me to be with them. The road to heaven is here and now. And thirdly, there's a, a, a blessed life is hope for the future. The future is not limited by our failures, ask Moses. It's not limited by our abilities, ask Jeremiah. It's not limited uh, by our current circumstances, ask Joseph. Joseph, who is, spent, is in the morning, is in prison with no end in sight, no, no get-out date. And by afternoon, he's equal with Pharaoh in the land. Your current circumstances are no indication. Nothing in you, uh, in your present, it limits anything to God's future for you. The future is assured by Jesus, not anyone or anything else. In Christ are the limits, and in him there are no limits. I, I, what I'm sharing with you is, a, a, um, is the blessed life. The past forgiven, redeemed, the present is is assured. You're right where you need to be for him to to work in your life. And the future is assured. And it doesn't depend on you or your limits. It's his grace and goodness. The power of the blessed life. Let me tell you just a little bit about that. Uh, uh, Cindy and I used to, when we lived in uh, the Tri-City area in East Tennessee, we went to a place called the Haven of Mercy. It was mostly a place for um, uh, recovering drug addicts and homeless people. And on Thanksgiving morning, we'd serve meals there. And I, I, I'd worked in um, homeless uh, shelters and, and um, soup kitchens in Washington, D.C. I, I used to take churches to trips there. There's a Presbyterian church on Capitol Hill where you can do that kind of thing out of, and you can take mission trips. And one of the things uh, they told us repeatedly is, don't touch these people and don't try to engage them in conversation unless they want to talk to you because a lot of them are mentally ill and a lot of them are just tightly wound. And they don't talk to each other much either. They just come in, they eat, and they drift away. I mean, if they, if they wanted relationships, if they could handle relationships, they wouldn't be on the street. So that we're there, everybody's seated, uh, the, the, the residents set up, we were cooking, we were all lined up, and, and the guy who was running the place, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the most godly men I ever met. He was just holy of a peace and at peace. And he thanked us for coming, he thanked them for being there, there were some families there. Um, he said a simple prayer, thanking God for his presence and our presence together. And then he didn't say amen. He started doing something that I thought was very strange and dangerous. He just started walking around and touched people. God bless you. God bless you. Just quietly. Every last one of us. There must have been about a hundred of us in the room. And at first, just my anxiety level went up. If you touch some of these people, they may not like it. But there was kind of a, a silence that fell on, that was there. And a sense of Peace as he just walked by and touched every last one of us on the shoulder of the head. God bless you. God bless you. And some people were in tears because some of these people have never been blessed in their lives. Do not doubt the power of the blessed life. And remember that you are blessed to be a blessing. And that's a pretty powerful thing. So to know Jesus is personal. It's also to know the blessed life. I'm going to move a little faster now. It's also a gift. Uh, Jesus says to Simon Peter, this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood. It was God's Spirit who revealed this to you. I think too often we tend to 
work at our faith in this regard. We tend to master it, or, or uh, we try harder, or we achieve knowledge, or when the Bible says to be still, to surrender, to wake up and be unaware, uh, to receive what God is giving. It's about receiving God's, um, the, the, God's self-revelation. He makes us himself known to us. Uh, is there anything that you have right now that isn't a gift of God? Is there anything? Your abilities, your knowledge, your education, where and when you were born, your marriage, your children, they're all gifts. It's all received. To know Jesus is to, is to be in a position to receive, to know that you're relationship with him is a gift. Fourth, the blessed life is a foundation for community. On this uh, affirmation that Jesus is Lord, I'll build my ecclesia, the called out, those who were called out to be my own. You are called out to be his, and we live in community. Um, think about the things we do as a community and only can do as a community. The life we share, the worship that we have. When we do hands of Christ, we do it as a community to bless others. When, and when we have those kids uh, from the Felician Center who come and do Christmas dinner here, it's the nicest place most of those kids will ever have been in their life, as our Grace Hall. And it's the nicest dinner they'll ever have, or have had up to that point in their life. And there's Santa Claus, and there's a Christmas tree, and there are prayers, and we talk to them about Jesus, and it's a safe place. And we can do all that because we share this life together. Our chief, the chief thing about us is to be present to him as he is among us. And then it's a foundation for abundant life. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Those aren't keys of authority. Those are keys of access and opportunity. Uh, our calling in Christ is to live the blessed life here on earth so that other people can see and know the grace, the goodness, the love, the forgiveness, the redemption that are all ours in Jesus Christ. That's what we were made to do. That's how we were made to live. This life in Jesus is personal. It's blessed. It's a gift. It's the foundation for our life together. And it's, how, it's the abundant life here and now the heavenly life lived here and now, together. Could any of us ask for any more? Let me pray for us. Father, let your spirit continue to work among us and in us, that we may be your people in this place, not just this congregation, but all of us together, black and white, Methodist, Presbyterian, Catholic, and Baptist, all together, the people of God, living new life in Jesus. And give us the grace to be grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I almost forgot. Affirmation of faith. There was a, in this first century, I just, I've been reading patristics, and that's the first century. And uh, they, they had what they called the rule of faith. And the rule of faith was not a series of rules. It was an affirmation. And strangely enough, we say the Apostles' Creed came along in the third century. It did not. It dates all the way back till, just, till the time the New Testament was still being written. They didn't have Bibles they didn't have uh, the New Testament all written out like we do, but they did have the rule of faith. This is how they knew what they believed and what they believed about Jesus. And if you would have asked them, they would have said something very similar to this. What do you believe? The early Christians would have said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered, under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So be it. You know, you look around, we're old, we're young. Uh, some of us are very young, some of us are not quite so young anymore. We're male, we're female, and we got a lot of differences. And a lot of differences in the people around us. But here's the truth about all of us. We are loved by God, redeemed by Jesus Christ, and alive in the Holy Spirit. Those are the most important things about us. And we share those things in common. As you go from this place, may the Lord bless and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. And grant you now, always, and in every circumstance of your life, the peace of his presence. Amen. Go in peace and go with God.